Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about sports and the mind-body connection. Our guest is Joel Kirsch, co-director of an energy training system with George Leonard. Joel is the sports psychologist for the San Francisco Giants. He's also worked with Olympic wrestlers, tennis and golf players, joggers, and professional ballet dancers, and he is the executive director of the soon-to-be-revived Esalen Sports Center. What is energy training? Well, Charlie, energy training is, uh, and it's really called Leonard Energy Training because George Leonard developed this art form. And it's a combination of uh, principles and practices from the martial art of Aikido, from Western psychology, and principles from physics. And George really put this work together, and then I joined him in a PhD program. And it's using these three elements in a specific body of work that offers alternative ways of looking at everyday life situations. And we've applied these, uh, uh, the Leonard Energy Training, to a number of different areas, uh, as you spoke in the introduction. How would you apply it, for example, to a professional baseball player? Well, there's a, uh, in, in regular sports psychology, Western sports psychology, uh, the big thing right now is uh, visualization, and everybody's on visualization and that's because it's in vogue and there is so much more to the mind-body connection and to sports than just simply visualizing something and then hoping that that thing will happen sometime later on there are a number of things including uh, being physically balanced uh, you know gym, uh, gymnasts uh, football players basketball players baseball players balance is a crucial issue and uh, your center of balance is located an inch or two below your navel in the middle of the abdominal cavity. And you've heard the thing about uh, me uh, concentrating or me uh, meditating on your navel, contemplating your navel, where there's, there's some reality to that. That's where power comes from the body, and that's where uh, balance comes from. And then you also have elements of rhythm and flow, pitchers and hitters talking about uh, having their rhythm, having to play enough to get their rhythm. There's also the element of concentration. Uh, the element of, of uh, uh, being relaxed under pressure. So there are a number of techniques that we have in Leonard Energy Training that we apply to baseball, football, tennis, golf, and these other areas. When you, when you talk about uh, concentration, are you talking about a relaxation technique that would allow the athlete to be more intuitive? to be able to be a better guesser of the fastball or the curve when they're at the, at, in the batting cage? Yeah, it's not so much to be more intuitive to uh, be able to guess fastball, curve, slider, whatever that might be. What it is is to, be, to expect nothing and be ready for anything. So you, have, you simply have no expectations whatsoever. And once you get rid of the expectations, then you are in the moment, you're present, and you're ready for anything that comes your way. And concentration is simply a process of, of stopping yourself from thinking and being totally present for what's going to happen at that moment. Those of us that have been fortunate enough to associate with professional athletes in any sport, whether it's golf or tennis or football or basketball or baseball or any other sport, realize that there is something physical very different about a professional athlete from an amateur athlete. Uh, if you consider yourself a really good basketball player and you can, uh, you're a great shot and you're real fluid on the court and you go out and play with Dr. J you, or Magic Johnson, you s quickly learn that there's something very special about their talent as opposed to your talent. It's a physical thing. What about the mental differences for professional athletes? Are there differences? Are they different mentally than you or I or other people that are walking around that are not professionals in that sport? Um they may or may not. It's a, a double-edged sword here because uh, concentration is concentration is concentration or mental uh, discipline is mental discipline and so on. And so you might have uh, somebody who isn't a great athlete might be a great leader of an organization like Thomas Watson at IBM. And he was able to apply himself, mentally discipline himself to make IBM what it is today. Uh, Dr. J., uh, you might say, is the Thomas Watson of the uh, basketball arena. So these people exist through all walks of life. I, I found them in ballet, and, you know, with the Olympic wrestlers, with the people in tennis, and with people uh, on the San Francisco Giants baseball team. So you see them through all walks of life. It's just whatever their endeavor is, 
they apply themselves, and eventually they surface uh, at the top of their profession. What are the mental attributes that help athletes perform better uh, besides concentration? Right. Uh, patience, diligence, and uh, surrounding those, perseverance. Being willing to stick it out and stay with whatever it is they're working on. Uh, there's an old Japanese saying that goes, uh, the difference between a master and the average person is the master stays with it five minutes longer than everybody else. And just as your body, uh, when you lift weights, you're, you're building up muscle in your arms and you're not building up muscle simply to lift weights, you're doing it to be stronger in either hitting a ball or throwing the discus or javelin. Well, the same thing applies to mental discipline. The more you work at it, the more you, you uh, stay with something, you are enhancing or putting more energy into your mental capacities to stay with something and see it through. You talked earlier about the, the center of energy in the body, and you talked a little bit about balance. Is that the same as balancing? What is balancing? Yeah, balance, you, you have uh, in the body two uh, systems of balance. One is your physical center of gravity located again an inch or two below the navel in the middle of the abdominal cavity. The, the Japanese call this hara, H-A-R-A. And you also have your vestibular system in the uh, inner ear. And both of these have to do with balance. And so it's, it's a twofold process. And uh, your basic uh, balancing act on a balance beam, you see uh, women doing this in gymnastics, uh, invokes both of these processes. So what you want to be able to do is one, to be able to move from center, from your physical center of gravity, and at the same time, you know, they do the flips in the air on these balance beams and just amazing things, just amazing things. And so you want to also be able to let your vestibular system, uh, when you're doing the twirls and spins, let things spin and go down and concentrate on your center because I'm sure everybody when they were a kid or if they were to get up right now and do it, you spin around in the room five or six times and then stop, the room keeps spinning. Well, of course it does. That's the vestibular system doing its job. And if you immediately drop to your center and concentrate on your center, the room will still spin, but you will not be off balance. And so you have these two things working for you at the same time. Does that work better for some people naturally than it does for other people? Yeah, uh, vertigo is a, a, a abnormality or whatever you want to call it, deficiency in the vestibular system. Uh, I have a George Leonard sister, Julia. Uh, it's difficult for her to uh, lay down and sleep at night uh, on a flat surface because uh, sh she has this problem. So she sleeps on two pillows, so she's propped up somewhat. And this is common uh, amongst uh, a lot of people. So the vestibular system is very, very important. And at the same time, the more you concentrate on your physical center of gravity in, in the abdominal cavity, the more you're able to deal with this situation. How do you go about, and staying with balancing for a minute, how do you go about teaching balancing? Uh, you have a hitter that, that uh, screws himself into the ground because he swings so hard and he's all off balance and it screws up his timing and then his eye because everything doesn't work and he's not hitting the ball and pretty soon he's sitting on the bench and he wants to get back on the team and in the game. This is exactly uh, what happened to one of the Giants who this year is having a great year. And uh, I noticed he was having trouble and he would really get down on himself, start swearing at himself and things like this. And so I went to him and I said... Uh, um, you know, do you want to work? And he goes, okay, let's give it a try. And so what I did was uh, I had him hold a baseball bat and in his starting position and then in three other positions as he would follow through with his swing. And at each point, what we would do is uh, uh, he would uh, use what's called soft eyes. It simply means uh, your eyes are open, but you don't look at any one thing in particular. It's like a meditative uh, uh, visual state and breathing from his center, his physical center of gravity, which, which gets, gets you to relax. It invokes what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And at each one of those four stages, I would push on him in four different directions, front, back, left, and right side, to see if he was unstable or off balance in any one of those positions. And sure enough, he was off balance forward. 
meaning when I would push on him from behind, he, it was easy for me to just push him off balance and he'd have to take a step to catch his balance forward. Now, if you look down at your feet, you see that the feet extend forward. So if anything, you should be off balance backward, not forward because of the support from the feet. Mm -hmm. And so we realized he would overswing or he would reach out too far with his body and be off balance. Well, we simply corrected that. I didn't work it with his mechanics of the swing. We simply worked with balance. And today, uh, at least as of today, he's having a tremendous year. And we're very excited about what's happening with him. Does he do that by a conscious effort to lean back more on his heels to put more balance? No. What it is is concentrating on his center. When he stands in the on-deck circle, uh, he war loosens up by swinging the bat and things like this. But he also, if... if uh, people were to know what he's doing and nobody knows he's been doing it all year he uh, takes his hand and places it on his center an inch or two below the navel and he concentrates on his center for maybe 30 or 40 seconds is that called centering yeah balancing and centering okay. and it does enough you do four things uh, when you do that one you enhance your ability to concentrate two you relax three you enhance your your sense of balance and four your sense of power because this is where physical power comes from that area your hips move first it's not as we think in america the macho thing of the big chest and the strong arms power originates in the center from the hips any great golfer will tell you that or any good batting instructor or I'll batting say. instructor yeah. Okay. yeah there you go what about blending oh blending yeah probably the most beautiful of all the art forms Blending is, is a process whereby, uh, oh, you've heard the expression, go with the flow or something like this. From the martial art of Aikido, the, the expression, each uh, syllable there means something. And I means harmony or to go with something. And uh, blending is very important in reducing your level of stress. If two forces come at one another, say uh, two football players, uh, offensive and defensive linemen, are going against one another. Uh, both have a certain amount of force coming toward one another. You have this great impact. But the people, the linemen who know how to blend, and I worked, I spent one day with the Stanford football team, oh, what was it, two or three years ago when Elway and people like that were there. And I worked with some of their linemen. And I showed them how by being balanced and centered and blending, in other words, the defensive linemen's rushing at them, let him go his way, but move with him. Don't let him go around you, but by staying or blending with his energy, you're able to keep him off the quarterback for a longer period of time so the quarterback can get the pass off. What's the philosophical foundation or base for what you do? Oh, uh, It has a Japanese philosophy or base, and this I... Uh, learned from what I did with my PhD studying the martial art of Aikido with George Leonard who's also a black belt a second degree black belt in Aikido and uh, uh, many of the the concepts the ideas the philosophies of the Japanese and their culture are embodied in Aikido and vice versa uh, what you see in Japan with their management what you see in American management today and what we've learned from the Japanese and what they've learned from us has a deep philosophical foundation from the old warlords and the era of the samurai. Um, uh, in Japanese business, uh, you've heard of lifetime employment. When you go to work for Sony or, or Toyota or whoever it might be, you're there for life. Well, that's the same concept as the old samurai, the, the code of Bushido, whereby a samurai uh, swore his allegiance to the warlord or the daimyo, as it's called in Japan. And the, the samurai said, I will lay down my life for you if that's what it takes. And the daimyo, or warlord, said, I will give you a plot of land and a house, and it's yours for life. And if you die in battle, I will take care of your family. So that same concept carried over into the Japanese culture. It's just that in 1868, with the what was called the Meiji Restoration, the samurai class was outlawed and the mercantile or business class came into power and so they simply transferred those ideas over into 
uh, business. And you see that uh, in Japanese business today and uh, um, in a number of other areas in the Japanese culture. And uh, those same, some of those same ideas are starting to take hold here in America. The philosophy of commitment? Commitment, discipline, uh, go, looking for the long term as opposed to the short term gains. Uh, my wife and I, we have a, a, a consulting company simply called Kirsch Associates. And we go and work with a number of the Silicon Valley and Fortune 500 companies because uh, they're looking for that competitive edge. And they know now that it's care uh, and concern for their employees that makes the big difference. There's a new bottom line, a bottom line below the bottom line. And it's not money, but it's the people who work for those companies. So you see a lot of this philosophical orientation in the American companies today. Meditation. Do you teach athletes, the athletes that you work with, to meditate? Yes. Uh, a very, very important process for emptying the mind. You know, the, me the idea of meditation is uh, the mind of no mind. Nothing is there. And uh, there's, a, there's a great little story, another Japanese story, about uh, this person who, an American who wanted to be enlightened, and he sought this great Japanese master, and the master sat down with this man to talk to him about uh, what this man wanted. And so as, as the first lesson for this Westerner who didn't know what was going on at the time, the master started pouring tea into the cup. And uh, he poured tea into the cup until the cup was overflowing and overflowing. And the Westerner said, stop, stop. You know, I just want a cup of, 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 of one cup of tea. And the master said, this is your first lesson. In order for me to feel your, fill your mind or your cup, you must first empty it so it doesn't overflow. And so uh, meditation is the same process of emptying the mind so you can get all that stuff that's in there out and it can either be filled or empty for whatever needs to be there at that present moment. What type of meditation do you uh, teach? Do you have a mantra or do you have breath uh, concentration? Or Right, I start with a... I start with... with a concentration process and then lead to simple or simply meditating. Concentrating and meditating are really two different things. Uh, I start with a, a breath and focusing on your center process and eventually they move into a meditation where they don't uh, concentrate or focus on anything. They're simply allowing whatever comes to mind to come to mind and then pass from their mind. So uh, to go straight to meditation is often difficult and a lot of people drop it. So what I do is start with concentration and then move into meditation. There's a lot of ongoing left brain, right brain research. Does it suggest any new ideas that will help athletes? Uh, assuming that the left right brain theory is true because there's a lot of research now that uh, on holonomic theory and holograms and thing like, things like this. Carl Prerum down at Stanford and other people are doing research on this. But let's, for the sake of argument, say left right brain is, is valid. Uh, what you have and, and the number one issue with the athletes, all athletes and dancers that I've talked with is concentration. And so the, the left brain, as most people who've done research in this, is your rational analytical thinking mind. The right brain is the creative, intuitive, athletic, artistic part. And so what we want to do is to be able to shut down the left brain and have the right brain more active. And one of the techniques in Leonard energy training that we have is called soft eyes. And George Leonard himself was hooked up to uh, an EEG. And uh, he was in regular vision or hard eyes, and then he went into soft eyes. And as soon as he went into soft eyes, the right brain stayed in beta, but the left brain went down into alpha, which means the right brain was more active or the intuitive creative side was dominant. And so in, in our culture, most people are left brain oriented. But uh, in order to do the artistic, intuitive, athletic kinds of things, you want to be in a right brain mode. And so simply by going into soft eyes and breathing from center, we have found that people automatically move into a right brain mode. When we talk about things like balancing, centering, blending, Aikido, meditation, we're talking about concepts that most often are placed in some kind of spiritual context, and yet you're using them with athletes that are involved in a competitive context. First question, does it help athletes in competition, and should it? Um, I'm glad you brought that up because 
first of all, the, the derivation of the word uh, uh, competition comes from the com, which means with, and petition, to petition something. And if you actually look at the derivation, it's to seek or to come together. It's not to compete against. Our culture has taken the word competition and the idea of it and, and changed it somewhat. And so uh, what we work with, the concept that we work with is that the opponent or the competition is not without. It's not the person uh, across the net for, from you or, or on the other side of the field. The real opponent is within. And once you're aware of the opponent within and you're aware of, of what it takes to deal with yourself, then the whole process of being a, a great athlete or fine athlete or competent athlete, whatever you want to call that, it changes. The whole paradigm shifts. And it's simply dealing with yourself more than it is your competitor. And in the way we look at it, uh, I want my quote-unquote competition or competitor to be at least as good, if not better, than I am. Because in that way, I will pl play at least to my own abilities and maybe my competitor will enable me to go beyond my current ability. So the better the competition, the better the game. I think that's all well and good if you're talking about um, a golf match where obviously you're playing against yourself, even a baseball game where it's really down to an individual performing at any one time. I think it becomes less clear when you're talking about a football game or you mentioned that you'd work with uh, Olympic wrestlers. How does a wrestler <laughs> work against himself when he's got a mass of muscles coming from a different setter that's trying to throw him around and uh, flop him on his back? Right. Uh, let's look at competition again. And the principle in physics, for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. Therefore, the more aggressive and the harder, uh, more violent I become, what I am doing is really... Uh, enhancing the potential or power of my opponent. But if I learn to blend, if I learn how to handle myself against this, this imposing force, and especially if that force has uh, more energy in it than you do, a stronger person, uh, a taller person, whatever that might be, you're not going to overpower that person because they have more uh, strength. But if you learn how to blend and handle yourself and stay calm, under those situations, then you'll be able to deal with that person. Uh, the perfect example of that in football is a man uh, who's now out of football by the name of Fred Dreyer, who played for the New York Giants and then the Los Angeles Rams. And um, Fred constantly played around 218, 225 pounds, going against people 265, 270. And yet he was one of the best defensive ends in football. And why? Because he didn't necessarily understand this philosophical concept but he knew how to work with it and he wouldn't go straight on against somebody 270 280 he'd work around them and he had to learn that for himself how not to go against the force but find the blend and work around the force a couple of the uh, former giants that i've talked to orlando cepeda and juan marichal have told me that had they discovered stretching techniques um, years ago when they were playing their careers would have lasted much longer than they did. Both of them had different uh, physical problems at one time or other in their career. In fact, most professional athletes do encounter some kind of physical problems. Will the kinds of psychological centering, balancing things that you're working with the athletes right now help to extend careers as well? Oh, uh, without a doubt. Um, the, the average mortality age for professional football players right now is 54. And that says a lot then about the sport and what it does to you mentally and physically. And the concept of stretching and injuries, uh, uh, if people haven't seen the May issue of Esquire magazine, there's a whole section there that George Leonard was the guest editor for on Ultimate Fitness. And one of the uh, articles there is on stretching. And when you stretch, it's the same thing as when you're playing a ball game. Uh, you have to concentrate. You have to learn to relax under the tension of stretching, and you have to breathe properly. And when I work with the ball players who want to do this kind of stretching that I do, as soon as I get them to start breathing and to relax when they stretch and not do the ballistic kind of stretching, but more of a yoga kind of stretching, uh, immediately on the spot, they're, they're, uh, they're able to, say if they're sitting down 
and reaching out trying to touch their toes immediately they move farther if they're stretching their sides uh, um, f leaning from side to side to stretch the lateral muscles uh, immediately they're able to move farther so this idea of being able to meditate or concentrate relax under the pressure of stretching uh, to breathe properly is an integral factor in stretching in performing better because you're stretched better and in reducing the amount of injuries when I worked with the ballet company um, nobody knows this but ballet people experience more injuries than professional football players and 90 percent of their injuries are from the knee down and we reduce the injuries with this ballet company from 75 down to 5 percent in a matter of one year and how did you accomplish that? Through the Leonard Energy Training techniques, which come from Aikido and Western psychology and principles in physics. Okay. Let's do an exercise right now, if we can, a mental exercise on the radio. And let's do it for a weekend golfer. There's uh -huh. a duffer listening out there somewhere okay. that went out today and shot 118 and was totally uh, beside himself because every time he hit a good drive, he had a bad second shot, and he really couldn't get it together. What can we do to help this person right now in the last couple of minutes? Okay, what I would suggest to, to that golfer, and I do this, my wife and I golf too, and we, we work at the game ourselves, is that uh, when they approach the ball, usually the, the reason people uh, swing poorly is they're so tense, they want to just mash that ball, right? I want to see it go 275 yards down the center of the fairway. As you're uh, approaching the ball, as you have your back swing, uh, what you are doing is you are saying to yourself and programming in your body, slow down, slow down, slow down, so that by the time you make impact, you are completely and totally relaxed. It's a process of taking your swing. When you come back, and you hold that back swing, and as you come down, you slow down even more than before so that you have a nice fluid swing. The hips move through first. And then you have that pretty drive that goes right down the center of the fairway. So it's a, it's a talking to yourself? It's uh, either talking to yourself. I really don't talk to myself when I do this. I uh, am aware of it. I'm aware of my body slowing down as I address the ball rather than speeding up. Because when you do that, you're, really, you're not really slowing down. You're just eliminating the tension in your body so you can have that natural swing that's already there. Would your exercise that you talked about with the hitter of uh, finding a balance by pushing from left, right, back, and front work with a golfer as well? Absolutely. Uh, golfers, uh, tennis, badminton, any sport where you have an instrument in your hand and you're swinging it, this would apply. Will the techniques that you're using right now with professional athletes affect the long-term future of the game? Are we going to see somebody hit 80 home runs in a year or uh, other uh, spectacular athletic feats? I think the best way to answer that is, is to look an example, at an example of that in Sadahara Oh, who is the Babe Ruth or Henry Aaron of Japan, and I think he ended up with 858 home runs uh, playing in Japan. He's now the manager of the Tokyo Giants, which uh, is the biggest team in, in baseball in, in Japan. And uh, Oh uh, practiced and studied the martial art of Aikido and he practiced with a, a sword or a bokken. And uh, he also used to use a real metal sword and cut straw with his strokes. And he would do the same things that I've talked about with the golfers and working with the ball player on the Giants. Uh, he would do those same kinds of things in cutting through the straw. And so the principles are the same. Uh, I know, I, I can't say you'll see 80 home runs, but I'm sure you'll see more beautiful, graceful, and probably more powerful art forms in sports uh, as this sports renaissance takes place. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening.